Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this another Lord's Day, that we can get together as Thy people and worship Thee in spirit and in truth. We thank Thee for this Thy Word and the Apostle Paul who wrote this book, inspired by Thy Holy Spirit, the book of Galatians. We thank Thee that Thou dost remind us of these important matters, which is to say, the danger of falling back into works thinking, which we constantly are tempted to do and do give in to such a temptation. Um, and so we pray that thou enlighten our minds, open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray, amen. We're looking at Galatians 5, 3, by the way, we're on page 452 in the book. If you have Luther's commentary and Galatians, let's begin with verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Um, as we've seen, it is not circumcision per se. That was the problem with the Galatians because Paul himself was circumcised and he circumcised Timothy. So it wasn't circumcision itself, but what was it? Larry, remind us of the problem with the Galatians. Rose up. Armin, you tell us. It wasn't circumcision itself, but it was what? They thought circumcision justified them. Right. It was the idea that something other than the gospel, the gospel plus something else is necessary for salvation. Belief in the gospel plus works. Incidentally, why, did, why didn't Paul attack? Notice he didn't attack the concept of circumcision. Uh, and the reason for this is that circumcision was huge. It was an important matter in all of the Old Testament and up until this very time. Um, think of what being circumcised, as Paul tells us, he was circumcised the eighth day. Think of what that matters, what that means. 1 John 5, 19, let's look at that. 1 John 5, Tom. 1 John 5, 19. You got it? We are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. So, how is that related to circumcision? Tom, you tell us. Um, because circumcision was a way that uh, the people were separated, the people of God were separated from the Gentiles. Exactly. It was the sign of God's covenant with his people. That God's people are a holy people. They always were, they always, they still are, and always shall be a holy people, meaning what? Maureen. Set apart from the world. Exactly. Set apart from everybody else. And Paul says, we are, as we quote again and again and again, Philippians 3, 3. We are the circumcision. We are the circumcision, which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the man. So, circumcision is not a physical phenomenon. 
Though it includes a physical phenomenon. What do I mean by that, Gary? Well, the physical phenomenon being the fact that a person is physically circumcised. They are right. physically just been changed. But circumcision itself is not a physical phenomenon, but it is what, Gary? Uh, it, is, it would be a, a, a holy phenomenon. Right, a spiritual phenomenon. That's why he says we are the circumcision which, which are physically cut with a knife, no, which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no common. Isn't that interesting the way he puts it that way? And have no, hey, we're the circumcision because we have no confidence in circumcision. How about that? Isn't that what he's saying? Owen, isn't that what you get? Yeah. Yeah. Worship, worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ and have no confidence in the circumcision. What would it be to have confidence in circumcision, Owen? Of the works of the law. Yeah. Okay. I'm physically circumcised, so I'm better than you are. Because circumcision is the sign of the covenant. I receive the kind of sign of the covenant, so I'm part of the covenant, so I'm okay. Hey, that was Nicodemus's problem. Right? Gary. Got it? Okay. I said that was Nicodemus's problem. See, I received the sign of the circ of circumcision, the sign of the covenant. Therefore, I'm part of the covenant of God's people. I'm part of God's people. And therefore, I'm okay. That was Nicodemus' problem. What was Nicodemus' problem? Larry, you came back. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, but I'm not sure. Well, Nicodemus thought he was okay because what? Because he was a Jew. Because he had received the sign of... That's how huge circumcision was in the Old Testament. Without circumcision, you have no right to be called the children of God. So, Psalm 147, 19 and 20. Another expression of the same phenomenon. Oh, and why don't you read that? Psalm 147, 19, and 20. He shall up his word unto Jacob, his statutes, and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so for any nation, and as for his judgments, they have not for them. Praise ye the Lord. See that? He showed his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation, meaning any Gentile nation. No, these are the people of God. So circumcision and baptism represent, we could say it this way, they rep both represent the kingdom of God. And consider this. Since circumcision was of such huge importance in the Old Testament, you can't deny this. You cannot deny the super importance of circumcision in the Old Testament. So if you're a Baptist, you've got to answer this problem. Since circumcision was such, such huge importance in the Old Testament, where did it go to? Malachi 3.6, what does that say? Reynolds. Change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. God's immutable. So the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. He didn't change. Circumcision was huge in the Old Testament. Where did it go to? It couldn't just disappear. And secondly, since baptism is so important in the New Testament, where was it in the Old Testament? You see how important these questions are, Gary. Yes, because it it it, um, <clears throat> it it forces 
a person to look at the Old Testament to realize that it, it, you can't have the old and the new. Right? You can't have one without the other. They, they coexist. Exactly. One blends into the other. The importance of baptism, the importance of circumcision. So baptism has to be the sign of the circumcision in the New Testament. And then if you consider the member that was circumcised and then question 102 of the Shorter Catechism, what do we pray for in the second petition? And the second petition which is, Thy kingdom come. We pray that Satan's kingdom may be destroyed and the kingdom of grace may be advanced, ourselves and others brought into it and kept in it, and that the kingdom of glory may be hastened. So, thy kingdom come. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. First petition, second petition, thy kingdom come. How does God's kingdom come? How did it come in the Old Testament? Suppose you saw somebody out in uh, amongst the Amalekites. And you said, what are you doing out here? And the guy says, I'm looking for Rahab's. I mean, would that make sense? Tom, you got it? Um. <laughs> Let me say it again. You find somebody all out amongst the Amalekites. And you say, what are you doing out here? And he says, I'm looking for Rahab's. Gary, what's my point? You got it? Yeah, I believe so. There's, it, it's that um, the people of God were not necessarily limited to just Israel. There were the uh, Rahab was obviously a Gentile, right? Right, but you don't go out looking for Rahabs. You see it? And 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 what's the reason? You didn't. They didn't in the Old Testament, and we don't in the New Testament. If we understand the scripture, if God doesn't change. Now, that's not to say that wherever you go, as you have opportunity, you bear witness to the truth. Of course you do. At the same time, what's my point? Owen, you got it? That God selects his people. Yeah, that, that, <clears throat> yes, people are... Regenerated people are saved outside the visible church. At the same time, that's not the way God's kingdom comes. It's not the way it's ever come. So God continues to save people the way he's always saved them. Let's go to Luther. Uh, let's go back. Uh, I don't think we finished this paragraph. In the lives of the fathers we read of Arsenius, of whom I made mention before, although he had lived a long time in the highest holiness and abstinence, yet when he felt that death was not far off, he began to grieve and fear exceedingly. He's speaking of the Rome, uh, of the Roman church. And these people who place such great emphasis on holiness and being a set apart set apart people being asked why he feared death seeing he had lived holily all his days and had served God without ceasing he answered that he had indeed lived blamelessly according to the judgment of men but the judgments of God were other than those of men so he by the holiness and austerity of his life had attained unto nothing else but the fear and horror of death if he was saved he must have cast away all his own righteousness and rested on the only mercy of God, saying, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Lord, which suffered, was crucified, and died for my sins, etc. The other exposition is affirmative. He that is circumcised, if also a debtor, is, not if. He that is circumcised is also a debtor to do the whole law. For he that receiveth Moses in one point must of necessity receive him in all. He that is he that of necessity observeth one part of the law hath a duty to observe all the other parts thereof. And it helpeth nothing to say that circumcision is necessary and not the rest of Moses' laws. For by the same reason that thou art bound to keep circumcision, thou art also bound to keep the whole law. So in other words, he's saying you can't keep the law piecemeal. It's a whole you're either justified by perfect obedience to the law or what? 
Jacob, you there? Yeah, you you are either justified by keeping the whole law, or you are justified by somebody else keeping it for you. Right, wow. and you have to be like we we've been saying the last couple of weeks in our sermons. I think you missed today, but the warning uh, God sent Ezekiel to be a watchman to the people of God. He says, if you warn the wicked. And if you warn the wicked and he does not return from his wicked ways, he shall die in his sins, but you have absolved yourself of guilt. But if you do not warn the wicked, he of course is going to die in his sin, but you will also go to hell with him. And the warning, it, and you don't choose your own warning. The warning is, O wicked man, thou shalt Surely die. How is that related to what we're talking about? You see it, Jacob? Yeah, I see. So if you're going to be a preacher of the law, then you have to keep it, just from what I understand. And, and, the, and the first use of the law is to show us our need for Christ, to show us our sinfulness, to show us that we are, as God says to Ezekiel, O wicked man. And we shall surely die because we can't keep the law. Let's jump down a couple of paragraphs. In this case, let him be dead and buried. Let no man. You now he's talking about. You now he's talking about. This is a phenomenal statement. Let Moses. He's talking about Moses. Let Moses be dead and buried, and let no man know where his grave is. I was just reading this passage the other day. I did not come within a million miles of thinking this. Isn't that a phenomenal thought? You see what he's saying. Owen, let Moses be buried and let no man know where is, where is Moses' grave. I don't know. No, nobody knows where it is. And so, and so what does Luther take from that? Let Moses be buried, buried and let no man know where his grave is. What's he talking about? You got it? Um. He's speaking of Moses as a representative of the law. Bury the law and don't go back looking for it because you can never be justified by keeping the law. That's what he's saying. The former exposition, that is to say the negative, seemeth to me to be more apt and more spiritual notwithstanding both are good and both do condemn the righteousness of the law. What's he talking about? The former exposition, the negative. Listen to what he says. The first is that we are so far from obtaining righteousness by the law that the more we go about to accomplish the law, the more we transgress the law. That's the first one, the negative. The second is that we that he which will perform any piece of the law is bound to keep the whole law. So you can't, first of all, you can't possibly keep the law. You're so far from obtaining righteousness by the law that the more you go about to keep it, the less you do keep it. And then secondly, if you think you can keep one aspect, you have to keep the whole thing. And to conclude that Christ profiteth them nothing at all which will be justified by the law. You see, he keeps hammering and hammering and hammering and hammering and hammering the same point. Hereby it appeareth that Paul meaneth nothing else but that the law is a plain denial of Christ. How now it is a wonderful thing that Paul dare affirm that the law of Moses which was given by God to the people of Israel is a denial of Christ. Why then did God give it? Before the coming of Christ and before his manifestation in the flesh, the law was necessary. See what he's saying. Hereby it appeared that Paul meaneth nothing else but that the law is a plain denial of Christ. And then, and then he says, Now it is a wonderful thing that Paul there affirmed that the law of Moses, which was given by God to the people of Israel, is a denial of Christ. Why then did he give it? Before the coming of Christ, and before his manifestation in the flesh, the law was necessary. Hey, does that make you think of anything? I hope it does. 
That's exactly what we're saying in the message today. Tell me, Owen. <laughs> I hope you can remember. Before the coming of Christ and before his manifestation in the flesh, the law was necessary. Go ahead. Uh, John the Baptist came preaching the law and repentance for... That's exactly, that's exactly what he's saying. That's exactly what he was saying and what I was saying today. The law and the gospel. What's the gospel in the narrow sense? Gary, remember? The broad sense, the narrow sense. Narrow sense is what? Uh, the narrow sense is... Uh, Christ. Right. Because he is the answer to the most important religious question. Right. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Well, what's the question? <laughs> they, hey, ask him, what are they going to say? Jacob. Jesus is the answer. How many times have you seen that bumper sticker? I'm older than you are, so I've seen it quite a few times more than you have. Jesus is the answer. So yeah. if you got a chance to talk to the person, ask, what's the question? What is it? Uh, how, how do we get to God? Exactly. That's how can a man be just with God? Yes. That's the question. And not, oh, uh, I need some help with my marriage. I, I need some help with my financial problems. I need some help with my depression. No. Christ is the gospel in the narrow sense. And we said that the gospel in the narrow sense presupposes the law. Remember we said that today? And the law, what? I'll be, I'll be very pleasantly surprised if you can remember this. The gospel in the narrow sense. Christ presupposes the law. And the law... Come on, Owen, see if you can come up with this one. And the law necessitates. See it? Christ presupposes the law. Because without the law, what, Gary? Without the law, you cannot see Christ. You don't have any, you have any need of Christ. Without the law, without a standard that you violated, what on earth do you need Christ for? So Christ presupposes the law. And then the law necessitates the gospel. And so we said the gospel in the, in the narrow sense is Christ. The gospel in the broad sense. Tom, you were here today. Is what? Uh, the gospel in the broad sense is the law. Right. Is the law and the gospel. That's the gospel in the broad sense. Let's go to uh, question number 85. And what is it? Roman. Question 85. This um, question 84 last week was what? What does, every, what does every sin deserve? Okay, Luther, what's the answer to that? Every sin deserves God's wrath and curse both in this life and that which is to come. Okay, what's the next question? What does God require of us that we may escape the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin? His wrath and curse due to us for sin. Roman. To escape the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin, God requires of us faith in Jesus Christ, repentance, and a life with a diligent use of all the outward means of our God. Christ communicated to us the benefits of redemption. Okay. So last week was what does every sin deserve? And what was the answer to that? Ellie, you there? Every sin deserves 
sin desire for God brought to the earth, but this life now which is to come. Okay. And first of all, question 84 deals with something that is so important in the whole of Scripture that you cannot have anything without it. And what is that? Is it the sin foundation and sin the commission? Okay, we're going to get to that in a second. But first of all, before you get to that, the word, the operative word here is deserve. What does every sin deserve? What does that speak of? Tom. Um, God's justice. Exactly. The importance of God ju God's justice is seen in the fact that both Arminians and Calvinists deny the justice of God. How did Arminians deny it? Gary. That's a pretty easy question. Question. And that question was, how do Arminians deny what? The justice of God. Oh, well, they say that sometimes God is uh, acts of mercy and not justice. Well, the uh, Arminian says Christ there, dies for who? Everyone. And then who goes to hell? Uh, those that excuse, or excuse me, I should have said who, who goes to heaven. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. They say Christ died for everyone, but who goes to heaven? Everybody? No, of course not. So, or those who believe in you. Right, so that denies the justice of God. How about the Calvinists? How do, the, how do the Calvinists a little bit... It's always more difficult to pin the Calvinists down. How does the Calvinists deny the justice of God? Jacob, want to take a stab at that? Well, I know R.C. Sproul says God acts with mercy in the cross, but not with justice. But I don't know why he says that. So. Yeah, well, we're not talking about just one individual person. Uh, the Calvinist position is that, um, well, I think you guys ever heard this statement before. Um, the Arminian position is all doors and no house. And the hyper-Calvinist, the true hyper-Calvinist position is all house and no doors. You ever heard that before, Jacob? Uh, I haven't heard of that before. Yeah, you, you get it? All doors and no house. Why did I bring this up? Because that's basically, think about what the Calvinists, Calvinists stand for, the free offer of the gospel. If you believe in the free offer of the gospel, you say that though God has determined to save only some men, however, when the gospel is preached, he suddenly denies, excuse me, he suddenly desires the salvation of every single person to whom the gospel comes. So you've got all doors, but you haven't got a house. What do I mean by that? You, you follow me, Jacob? I, 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 yeah, I think I do. I think uh, they're giving an offer, but there's no doctrine. There's, no, there's nothing to believe. Yeah, well, yes, but even further than that, that if, if you extend the so-called offering, what we mean by what they mean by offer is offering the sense of offering somebody a piece of cake. Uh, if you extend this to every single person and yet Christ did not die for every single person, then you are offering some persons something that's not available for him. You follow uh, me? I see. Okay, you see? I see yeah. What makes it uh, available? What, what makes it available? Yeah. Only God bringing life to his elect. And, and, but we're speaking, don't forget, we're speaking of the justice of God. Christ's yes. purchase, right? Oh. Yeah, Christ's purchase, yeah. Makes it available. And so we preach uh, the gospel, which is what, what's our summary of the gospel? Um, Larry. What is the gospel? The gospel is a proclamation as to what? How God can be a just God. And how he can, can receive sinners unto himself. Exactly. Without, uh, without violating his law. 
without violating his justice. That's the gospel. So, um, we talked also last week of how question 84 refutes common grace. Jacob, you remember that? You were here last week, right? Yeah, question, question 84. Yeah, where it says, uh, what does every sin deserve? And the answer is, yeah, every geez. sin... Right. How does that refute common grace? You remember? Uh, well, it shows that God doesn't love everybody. Uh, right. Because not everybody deserves God's love. Well, the Calvinist would say, the the, the common gracer, he would say that um, the reprobate. Well, God has grace on Right, he says that the reprobate deserve uh, wrath in the life to come, wrath to be to be cursed in the life to come, but he's blessed in this life. See, but the but the question eighty four says um, every sin deserves God's wrath and curse, both in this life and that which is to come. Okay, so today we're looking at question eighty five, which is. <clears throat> Perhaps just as important as question 84, but for a different reason. So what is that again? Uh, recite that again, Ellie. Question 84. Excuse me, question 85. What does God require of us? Go. That we... Uh, what does God require of us that we may escape the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin? To escape the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin, God requires of us faith in Jesus Christ, repentance and left with the diligence from all the outward need, whereby curse can be given to us the benefits of redemption. Okay, first of all, what does God require of us? Right off the bat, we're dealing with two phenomenally important um, doctrines. Do you see it, Owen? What does God require of us? Faith and repentance. Yeah, but even before that, God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. And the false gospel, both the Arminians and the Calvinists, they never... It's kind of hard to get your head around this at first, but after a while it's pretty clear to see. The false gospel, both the Arminians and Calvinists, they never believe in God's sovereignty. Now, once again, it's easy to show how the Arminians deny God's sovereignty. Well, but first of all, we have to define it. What is God's sovereignty? Gary. God's sovereignty is His ruling and Controlling all things. Okay, so what are God's works of providence, Calvin? God's works of providence are His most holy and wise, powerful, and preserving and governing all His creatures and all their actions. That's it right there. Holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing all His creatures and all their actions. That's the sovereignty of God. How does the Arminian deny the sovereignty of God? What would you say, Gary? Well, the Arminian denies the sovereignty of God by saying that it is man's choice. Right. The ultimate man. Therefore, man is sovereign. That the ultimate reason why I make it to heaven is I did something that this other guy did, so God is does not govern all his actions. How about the Calvinists? Once again, it's more difficult. Um, what would we say? Somebody come up with it. How do the Calvinists deny the sovereignty of God? Jacob, what do you think? Um, with the free offer of the gospel. Uh, okay, that's part of it. Definitely part of it. Uh, another thing is they believe in what is what they call unequal ultimacy. Mm, yeah. And what is that? What First of all, what is equal ultimacy? As, as I understand it, it means that basically what equal ultimacy, ultimacy is double predestined. Right. 
And what? I just want to see not only breed us and still the life, but not those who are uh, predestined to crap and hell. Well, to use the word ultimate in our definition, equal ultimacy, meaning uh, that everything that happens in the universe happens uh, ultimately for one reason, one reason alone. That's the will of God. See? Both the salvation of the, the elect and the damnation of the reprobate. They happen, ultimately speaking. Now, do people go to hell because they sin, Jacob? Yes. Yes, yes. but not ultimately so. You see it? That's an that's a important distinction. Do people go to heaven because they believe, on, believe in the gospel? Not because, no. Well, they, <laughs> they believe, they go to heaven owing to the fact that they believe, they call, we call ourselves believers. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Yes, you go to heaven um, owing to the fact that you believe, but not ultimately so. Yeah, not ultimately so. The faith that you have is given to you by God. So, the unequal ultimate position says that people go to heaven owing to the will of God. But people go to hell, ultimately speaking, not owing to the will of God. So you're denying the sovereignty of God. So, um, and the uh, what's really interesting is uh, two different people, reformed, huge reformed leaders, one of them was asked this question. Somebody got him a question and answer and he says, um, how can we believe, since you say we believe in limited atonement, how can we believe in limited atonement and still preach the gospel to everybody? Don't forget we're talking about the sovereignty of God. Owen, remember that? And what was his answer? Do you remember what he said? How can we believe in limited atonement and still preach the gospel to everybody? What did he say? Wasn't this an answer because we preach the gospel based on the free offer, not the limited atonement? His answer was this. He says, his answer was a non-answer. He said, the tension you feel, I feel. In other words, I got the same question you do. The problem is, we don't feel any tension in believing in limited atonement and believing that we preach the gospel indiscriminately to all men. So why does he feel, this is so key, relating to the sovereignty of God, why does he feel tension? Tom, do you know? I'm trying to think. Um, yeah. He feels tension. Here's the answer. He feels tension in believing in limited atonement and also at the same time preaching the gospel indiscriminately to all men because he sees the gospel as communicating to everyone God wants to save you. You see it? Now you got a problem. Now you're denying the sovereignty of God. But why don't we feel tension, Gary? in believing in limited atonement and preaching the gospel to all men. I mean, that, that is one. We don't feel the tension because it is, it is God's problems. Yeah, because we, up to... we don't know who the elect are. So we preach the gospel indiscriminately knowing that God will, through the gospel, save those He has chosen and those to whom He has given the Son. And then the other major reformed leader who basically, if you think about this, is exactly the same position. This is how these guys operate. You try to crawl into their minds and see where they're going with, with, with their statements. So the first guy says, there's a tension because his concept of preaching the gospel is communicating to every single person, God wants to save you. Well, how is that consistent with limited atonement? It isn't. So he calls it a tension. Here's the next guy. He says, 
The title of his book is Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. Alright? Think about this, Jake. What's the point of the book? Right up front. You know what he's saying, right? As soon as you see the title, you know where he's going. What's he, where is he going? Which is good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the title, right? Well, do we believe in evangelism? What's that? Evangelism. So the title is Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God? Right. Okay. And, and let me give you a hint. On the back of the book, it has a picture of a rocking chair. <laughs> It wasn't George Jones. I don't need no rocking chair. The, on the back of the book, there's a picture of a rocking chair. You get it? Um, I don't. I'm not following. I'm okay, not. here it is. If you believe in the sovereignty of God, does that mean you just sit back in your rocking chair and wait for God to save who He's determined to save? You see it now? Yeah. So the. That's not my the, the problem posited by the title of the book is how can we believe in God's sovereignty and still actively evangelize? That's the problem. You see how that's related to the other Reformed guy? Tom. Yeah, because they're both They're both um, kind of betting on, not betting, that's the wrong word, but they're both betting on like your, your response to it, right? Yeah. The first guy, the question posed to the first reformed leader was, how can we believe in limited atonement and preach the gospel on every single person? How can, every, how can a man be responsible to believe the gospel when he's not, when, when, when Christ hasn't died for him? See? The second guy, he's saying, how can we believe in the sovereignty of God and still actively evangelize every single person? And here's his answer. Listen carefully to his answer. He says, these are twin truths. Twin truths. You have to believe in the sovereignty of God and you have to believe in the responsibility of man because both of them are taught in scripture. Do you agree with that, Jacob? I mean, uh, Gary, do you believe that both are taught in scripture? Yeah. Exactly. God's sovereign. Man is responsible. So we preach the gospel believing in the responsibility of man. Believing in the sovereignty of God. But notice carefully, he calls them twin truths. And what's really interesting is what he's doing, he's doing the exact same thing as what they did to me when I was a kid in the Baptist church. Remember this one, Gary? I'm sure uh, with your Baptist background, you've heard this one. So they say, the Baptists say this. Okay, so you're going up to the gate of heaven. And on the front of the gate of heaven, it says, Whosoever will may come. So you go into the gate and you look behind you and it says, Chosen from the foundation of the world. <laughs> so... You say, so you so, so we'll say what? So what are they trying to say, Gary? Well, the way that that was actually taught to me was that. Uh, so you heard it too. <laughs> What's that? So you heard it too. Yeah. God had to look through time to see who was going to, you know, uh, who was going to choose him and who was not, and those are the ones who were. Well. Well, it, 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 it's, it's, they're asking you, they, they're asking you to believe a contradiction, right? So whosoever will may come. Okay, man has a free will. And then once you walk through the gate of heaven, you look behind you and it says, chosen from the foundation of the world. Jake, do you see the problem? <laughs> yeah, it's frankly a contradiction. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 what, and what does the Baptist tell you? He says, just take it by faith. Take it by faith. Well, you can't believe in a contradiction. But here's what, here's what this reformed leader is he's saying, the same exact thing. He defines this as an antinomy. The sovereignty of God and evangelism and the responsibility of men. He calls it an antinomy, A-N-T-I-N-O-M-Y. 
And if you look up antinomy in the dictionary, it says it is a synonym for contradiction. And he reads the definition in the dictionary. And he says, but for our purposes, <laughs> but for our purposes, it doesn't mean that. For our purposes, what does it mean? It means this, okay? You must believe in the sovereignty of God because the scripture teaches it. You must believe in the responsibility of man because the scripture teaches it. But, and, and, and these two things go together, but we don't know how they go together. It's the exact same thing as the Baptist. You take it by faith. But what's he really saying? Owen. And he believes in Erdog. That he believes in not the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man, but the sovereignty of God and the autonomy of man. Which means he believes in the autonomy of man and denies the sovereignty of God. Just like the Arminian's illustration of whosoever will may come and then you turn around and you see chosen from the foundation of the world. So the importance of the sovereignty. What does God require of us that we may escape His wrath and curse due to us for sin? To escape the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin, God requires of us faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, but before we get to that, the um, some people accuse the Westminster divines in this question of what? Can you guess what they would accuse them of? Owen, what does God require of us to escape his wrath and curse due to our sin? What would they accuse them of? Um, free offer. They accuse him of legalism. See that? How can God require something of a man who can't perform it? And here's why they're not guilty of the... They accuse him of legalism. That man is able to uh, perform some requirement of God. But look back at question 29 of the Shorter Catechism. How are we made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ? Tom, tell us. We are made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ by the effectual application of it to us by His Holy Spirit. By the effectual application of His... How does the Spirit apply to us the redemption purchased by Christ? Tom. How uh, the Spirit applies to us the redemption purchased by Christ by working faith in us and thereby uniting us to Christ in our special thought. Okay, and what's the operative word there? The Spirit applies to us the redemption purchased by Christ by Factual. by working faith in us. At the same time, the Westminster Divines say, what does God require of us? And we may escape His wrath and curse. Due, and what's the first thing? That we may escape His wrath and curse. Due to what God requires of us faith in Jesus Christ. So He requires of you something that you are or you are not able to perform. Jake? Yeah. I say, question? Yeah, my question is, uh, what does God require of us that we may escape His wrath and curse due to us for sin? And the answer is faith in Jesus Christ. So is he or is he not requiring of us something we're unable to perform? He is requiring something we cannot perform. Yeah. I, uh, I remember somebody put it this way. I really like the way they said it. Man at the fall lost his, obili lost his ability to perform that which God requires of him. But God did not lose his authority to require it. I like that. God is not going to um, remove His requirement of you simply because you're no longer able to perform that which, you, which He requires. Um, so, so the Calvinists think that God can't require it of you. You can't. You don't have the ability. 
Yeah. That's both the Arminian and the modern day Calvinists. That um, God doesn't require a man something he can't perform. But what, what did we say in the sermon today? Remember, we said saving faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. Repentance unto life. Well, we just said, how is it that man being totally depraved, how does he exercise faith in Christ? Owen, what's the answer? We just said it, right? Question 30. By the Spirit working faith in us. Working faith in us. He requires, God grants, remember the words of, who was it, Augustine, God grant what's, with that which thou dost um, desire. God, uh, command what thou dost desire and grant what thou dost command, which is how it works. But we said that faith has a subjective element and an objective element. And what is the subjective element? Remember that? Uh, Jake wasn't here. Uh, Tom. What's the subjective element of faith? Subjective and sanctification. No, subject ele subjective element of faith is something you believe about yourself. Remember? And what is that? Yeah. But I would be total depravity. Total depravity. And the objective element is what we were talking about in the message today. Owen. Faith in Jesus Christ. What is it that a person believes in Christ? Uh, what, he, what he did. He was born in Bethlehem. Is that good enough? No. Uh, how about the virgin? He was, he was born of a virgin. Is that good enough? No. He performed miracles. <laughs> That's the, uh, reminds me of that book, Christianity versus Liberalism. The author of the book said, incidentally, this guy is the founder of the OPC denomination. He says, Christian, his uh, book was called Christianity and Liberalism. He said, liberals are not Christians because they deny cardinal truths of the Christian faith, such as the virgin birth. They deny the miracles. They deny the resurrection. They deny the infallibility of Scripture. But what's, what's the problem here? Jake, do you see it? It is true, right? <laughs> it's true that the liberals deny all those things. But what's the point? Yeah. So he said that they're not... I, I, I didn't totally follow that. I just left. I'm okay. sorry. Okay. He says this. In this book, Christianity... That's a, this is a, a, a major... A book over the last written over the last hundred years, by the way. Um, it's called Christianity and Liberalism. He says that, oh yes, we have things in common with the Roman Catholics, despite our big differences. We have in, we have things in common with the Armenians, despite our differences. But now the liberals, they're not even Christians because they deny. You see where you see where he's going. They deny the virgin birth, they deny the miracles, they deny the resurrection, they deny the infallibility of the scripture. What's the problem? You see it? He's calling these people non-Christians for some reason other than the fact that they disbelieve the gospel. See it now? Because they history the historical accounts. So, and it's the same reason why these same people, and if he were still alive, he would be one of them. They say to us, as soon as they hear what we're saying, as soon as they hear us say, every single Christian believes the simple doctrine of justification by faith. What's the first thing they say, Owen? About justification. By faith? No, when we say this, when we make this statement, every single Christian believes in the simple doctrine of justification by faith. What does the Calvinist accuse us of? Oh, um, 
requiring perfect knowledge. <laughs> exactly. You're saying a person has to have perfect doctrine to be a Christian. Are we saying no? But you see, did you see it in that guy's statements? What he's saying is that this liberal, this person he calls a liberal, is not even a Christian because he doesn't believe enough stuff to be saved. It's justification by works. Okay, so, but today in the message, what do we say? Is the objective aspect of faith. Subjectively, we believe something about ourselves. Objectively, we believe something about Christ. And what was that? Armin. He died on the cross and kept the law perfectly. Right. And how does that correspond to us? It solves our problems of sins of commission and omission. Right. We've done those things which we ought not to have done. Jade. So what? It, which? how did Christ solve that problem? Sins of commission. We've done those things which we ought not to have done, and so Christ did what? He died on the cross. Exactly. We left undone those things which we ought to have done. How does he solve that one? He lives. Exactly. And then justification by faith. So we believe. How does faith come in? In other words, what I'm asking now, I didn't make myself clear enough. What's the relationship? Okay? A person believes those things, but what's the relationship between faith and salvation? It's not justification because of faith. What is it? Remember? Remember the uh, reservoir illustration. Larry, you remember that one, right? <clears throat> yeah, it's the... Faith is the conduit which you get the water from the reservoir to the house. Right. And the water represents what? Our, our, it's Christ's righteousness. Right. We have to have the righteousness of Christ. He has to take us from completely positive in the negative to not only to zero, but He takes us to completely negative in the positive. Excuse me. Uh, uh, he, he takes us, he causes us to be negative in the negative and positive in the positive. So we have to have that right, otherwise we can't stand before God. And this righteousness comes to us through the conduit of faith. Justification by faith. Through faith, Christ's righteousness is what, Tom? Imputed. Right, is imputed to us. And look at Acts twenty twenty one. Read that one, uh, Owen. Acts twenty twenty one. Acts twenty twenty one. Okay. Now, this is really interesting. I heard a guy talking about, um, he was giving a series of messages on the Westminster Confession, and he posed this question. Which comes first, repentance or faith? Be careful. It's not as easy as it sounds. Which comes first, repentance or faith? What does it sound like in this verse, Owen? Uh, repentance 
repentance for it sounds like right yeah it sounds like repentance but 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 don't go too fast because look at Hebrews eleven six. Read it. Okay. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. So if repentance precedes faith, then what does that mean? That means your repentance can't please God, correct? Yes. So, repentance can't come before faith. So Paul, the Apostle Paul here, is not giving us an order. He's not saying, first repentance, then faith. He's saying the same thing we said in the message today. In fact, I'm kind of regret I didn't mention this verse. Acts 20, 21. Because repentance toward God, that's John the Baptist. You see it? And then faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You've got the prophet coming first. Showing us, as, the, as uh, John the Baptist uh, was the message of repentance. And then, which is, comes from the law, repentance toward God. Why doesn't it say repentance toward Jesus, toward Jesus Christ and faith toward God? Jake, tell us. This is an important point. He doesn't say repentance toward Jesus Christ and faith toward God. He says repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. What's the question? I said, why does the Apostle Paul in Acts 20:21 20, he says his message is repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ? Um, I, I guess I have a question because I always thought it was repentance to mean change your mind. Repentance? Yeah. Of course it means yeah. a change of mind. So and, I, I well, suppose I, I kind of look at repentance and belief almost as a tautology. You can't believe something without changing your mind of what you believed before. That's a good point. So when Paul says his message is repentance toward God, he's not saying, which was, the, which was the point I was trying to make a few minutes ago, he's not saying that a repentance, that repentance is without faith. He's saying that to be saved, we must realize, which is a realization through faith, that we have violated the law of God. See that, how that relates to John the Baptist? Yes. And then, so in other words, repentance is an admission of the problem. And what's the problem, Jake? Uh, the problem is what we are. We are sinners. Exactly. So you change your mind. What did you think before? Hey, what did you think about yourself when you were born? As far back as you can remember. Maybe three years old, four years old. What did you think about yourself, Jake? I thought I was all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I remember the fireman, uh, policeman or fireman, I can't remember, coming to our school when I was in elementary school. And he said, now, there's some bad guys out there. And I was thinking to myself, yeah, but I'm not one of them. <laughs> right? I mean, every single one of us. So, the Holy Spirit causes you to change your mind about yourself. Now what do you think? Well, now I see what I am. Or what you were, yeah. You saw the, by, the, by the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit that you were as bad as you could possibly be. That you were utterly indisposed. Westminster Confession, chapter 6, paragraph 4. Utterly indisposed to all good. Utterly disabled to all good, made opposite to all good, and wholly inclined to all evil. That's change of mind. Now you believe the opposite of what you used to think about yourself. Right, Owen? Yes. Yeah. I'm completely positive in the negative. I'm completely negative in the positive. That's conviction of sin right there. And that concept, if you believe that, you will be annihilated unless... Unless what, Owen? Uh, 
Christ. Exactly. I remember uh, something that Calvin said. Calvin said this. There is no danger of thinking too little about yourself. In other words, that you are indeed completely positive and negative, or you were, and completely negative and positive. He said there's no danger of thinking too little of yourself as long as you realize that everything you lost in Adam is recouped in Christ. I love it. So, admission of the problem. Changing your mind about yourself. See what we just said? Jake, do you see what I'm saying? The subjective aspect of faith is what? Is to believe what you were. Right, exactly. And the objective aspect is faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. Subject is asking, I'm as bad as I could possibly be. If you think, if you think that you had, before, before you were saved, an inkling of righteousness in five minutes, what's that going to be? You're the greatest person that ever lived. <laughs> if you know yourself, so God causes us to realize that and we and he saw that the, the wickedness Genesis 6 5 the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually so and then lastly the diligent use of all the outward means whereby Christ communicated to us the benefits of redemption this is called the means of grace. The means of grace is a reformed or a covenantal view. The Baptists don't... Have you ever heard a Baptist talk about the means of grace? Gary. The they don't believe in them. The means of grace. What are they? The word, sacraments... And prayer. And especially the word. The diligent use of all the hour means whereby Christ communicated to us the benefits of redemption. The diligent use. Why do you think they put that word in there? Diligent. Owen. Because it's of great use. Because what? Like it's the most important. It's the most important. Yeah. Was it more important than your breakfast this morning? <laughs> I didn't have breakfast yet, but oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I forgot. Yeah. You started it uh, pretty early. How about your supper last night? Yeah. That's what we're talking about. The diligent use of all the hour means whereby Christ communicates us the benefits of redemption. And he humbled thee. I think of Deuteronomy 8.3 and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not neither did thy fathers know. Hey, remember, remember the thing about that manna that's one of the most important aspects of it is so, so God tells the, the children okay, I'm going to give you this manna. Now you go out there and you get you a week's supply and put it in your shed. Is that what he said? April. I'm sorry, could you repeat that please? Remember in the Old Testament in the wilderness, God sent manna for the people of Israel. And did he say this? Okay, I'm going to give you a week's supply at once and you just put it in your shed and you take whatever you need as you need it. Is that what he said? No, he only gave them as much as they needed at a time. It, one day at a time. One day at a time. <laughs> uh, so, how does that relate? The diligent use of all the outward means whereby Christ communicated to us the benefits. The, the diligent use that we attend worship because we can't do without it. Christ is speaking. What did that manner represent? Did we, you know, we talked about that today. Gary. Gary. 
Huh? Christ. Right. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. I'm the manna. And guess what? How often do you need me, Jake? How often do you need Christ? Yeah, what is he? Every day, right? <laughs> and every week. The diligent use of all the outward means whereby Christ communicated to us the benefits of redemption. The outward means, I love that. Diligent use of all the outward means. The outward means. And we talked about how was the word made effectual to elect for salvation. Roman. The Spirit of God. The Spirit of God makes it especially the preaching of the word and the means of convincing and converting sinners and building them up in holiness and comfort to faith and salvation. When it speaks of the reading of the word here, it's not talking about what? How many times have I said this? Larry. It's not about personal reading. It's about corporate fellowship. Exactly. Uh, the, the preaching, the, the reading of the word in worship. God will have you realize your total dependence on him. Yeah, but especially the preaching of the word. Because when the word is preached by an ordained minister of, of God, of Christ, then Christ is speaking to you. And just in our group, I've noticed the people that are the most diligent in attendance on the means of grace. Hello. They have progressed the most. Their children have progressed the most. And so, the importance of question 85. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this another time together. We thank you for thy word and the clarity of it. We thank you for these men that tell us raise up the Westminster Divines to put these questions together in the order that they put them together. That we are required to exercise faith though we are apart from thy spirit totally and utterly unable to perform that which is required of us. And so thou dost make us cognizant of our total dependence on thee. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.